Okay. Hello, um, those watching this uh, recording. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you're watching this. Uh, my name is Rumi, and today I'm going to be teaching about energy and work. Now, before I start this lesson, I want to give some background uh, information. These are some topics, uh, prerequisite topics that you should be familiar with, um, that I'm assuming that those watching this video are familiar with before I, I, I get, go ahead. So the first one is forces and free body diagrams. And the second is scalars and vectors. Um, if you're not too familiar, don't worry, you won't be confused. Um, I will try my best to explain um, in, in detail. So first, energy. Starting with energy, what is energy? Um, in the world of physics, energy is the ability or capability to do work. So in simple terms, an object with a lot of energy can do lots of work. And objects with little energy can do very little work. Now, um, some background, we, there's a law of conservation of energy. I know most people are familiar, but I will go over that law so that we can uh, remember what it is. So the law of conservation of energy states that um, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be converted from one form to another. And we can think of various examples, even in our everyday lives. Um, we eat food, that food is fuel for us, and that gives us um, energy that we can use to do other work. And if we don't have that energy, sometimes we feel tired, or we're not able to move as much. Um, that's just an everyday example of conversion of energy from one form to another. So nothing, no energy is ever created or destroyed. It's all recycled in the environment, transferred from one form to another. Now, there are many forms of energy. Um, in the world of physics, we deal mostly with kinetic and potential energy. Um, under kinetic energy, um, there is electrical energy, which is of moving um, electrons in, in, a, in a circuit or in a conductor. Um, we're not really going to discuss with that, but I just wanted to show the different forms of energy. There's also potential energy, which is energy in storage, right? So that energy can be stored in, it can be chemical potential, which is energy stored in food and fuel. Elastic potential, you have springs that store elastic potential energy as well. Um, you have nuclear energy and gravitational energy. Uh, we also experience energy in different ways. So we have sound energy, light energy. I just wanted to highlight the different forms of energy. Now we move on to work. So work in simple terms is a process of energy transfer or change. So work is energy to transfer to an object when a force acting on the object moves it through a distance. So there are two, two major um, uh, words that I want to highlight in that definition, which are force and distance, right? So we use work in everyday conversation to mean many different things. We talk about going to work, doing homework, classwork, uh, working out if you go to the gym. But in physics, it means something very specific. So work is the process of transferring energy from objects or a system to another or um, to another or converting energy from one form to another. And it's through a force. So it's through, for example, we have an object. That object doesn't do work unless there's a force and there's a and it moves a distance. So I will explain that in further detail. So work is basically the product of force. Force and displacement. And that force, the displacement has to be in the direction of the force. That's a very key thing to note. So work is done when a force moves an object in a distance in the direction of the force. Now the question is, is work a scalar or a vector? Recall what a scalar is and what a vector is. Think about what work is and think about whether it's a scalar or a vector. Okay, so work is a scalar. And why is it a scalar? A scalar, remember the definition of a scalar, a scalar is a quantity, it doesn't have direction, but a vector does have direction. If we think about work, 
even though work combines force with displacement and displacement does have direction, the quantity, the resulting product does not have direction. It's simply a quantity. So just keep in mind that work is a scalar. It has no direction. Now, work can be done by a force that is at an angle to the displacement. But when this happens, we need to find the component of the force in the same direction to the displacement. Now, there's a common formula for work, which is work is equal to force cos theta times distance. I'm going to show you how we get that formula. So for example, let's say you're in an airport and you're pulling your suitcase, like this woman in this diagram, um, she has a, she's at the force that she's exerting on the object is in this direction. But the direction in which the object is moving, which is her suitcase, is in this direction. We need to find, in order to find the work that she's doing, we need to find the component of the force that's acting in the direction that the suitcase is moving. So we need to find the force in this direction. Now, um, it's easy to memorize the formula, but in case you can't memorize the formula, I'm going to show you a quick way to derive this formula from the diagram. So we have force acting at some angle. We don't know what that angle is. And we know that the object is moving is this direction. And this is the force. The angle in between that is theta. Remember that we have uh, a mnemonic. So, ka, tua. And if you're not familiar with this, this is a uh, basic trig, which tells us that sine theta is equal to the opposite over uh, the hypotenuse. Cos theta is equal to the adjacent over the hypotenuse. And tan theta is equal to the opposite over the, over the adjacent. My bad. In this case, if we make this into a full right angle triangle, we have the hypotenuse as our force. We have, this is the opposite, which is opposite the angle that we have. And we have our adjacent as our distance. Now, we don't have the hypotenuse. We're not considering the hypotenuse. What we have is our, is our um, sorry, we're not considering the opposite. What we have is the hypotenuse and the adjacent angle. So we can't use sine and we can't use tan. What we have is cos theta. And this tells us that using cross multiplication that the hypotenuse times cos theta is equal to the adjacent, correct? Now we can substitute hypotenuse with the force, which is what it is. And then cos theta is equal to the distance, the, the direction, um, so is equal to the adjacent, right? So we need the component of the force in that direction. So we need to multiply F cos theta is now the component of the force acting in the direction of the distance. Is that clear? I hope that's clear. Okay. So we know that F in the X or in the x direction, let's say this is the x and this is the y, and this is the force. So f in the x direction, in the x direction, which is the direction of the displacement in this case, is equal to f cos theta. And to find the work done in that direction, it's f cos theta times the distance it moves. Okay. So now that we've discussed that, we can go into units. So the SI unit for work, which is the standard unit that is used is Newton meters. And how that is derived is force, which is measured in Newtons times distance, which is measured in meters. And so we get Newton meters. We use the word, the term joules because one Newton meter is equal to one joule. And again, Joules is the unit for measuring energy and work. Remember that work is just the process of transferring energy from one form to another. So 
work is change in energy. And if we do a sum or a, a difference of energy, we'd have, uh, for example, let's say uh, final energy minus initial energy, which is work. If we have final energy in joules and our initial energy in joules, the, the, the unit of work would still be joules, which makes sense. So it makes sense that energy and work have the same unit, which is joules. Now, we've talked about what force is, which is the product of, we've talked about what work is, which is the product of force and a distance in this, um, and displacement in the direction that the force is acting. Now, when, how do we know if work is done or work is not done? In a lot of our day-to-day, -day, um, like I mentioned, in our day-to-day -day, uh, lingo, we use the term work very loosely. Uh, we say we do homework, we say um, we put work in, right? But how do we know if work is actually being done? So if there is no force, if force is equal to zero, then the product of the force times distance would be equal to zero. If our cos theta is zero or our angle is 90 degrees, then there's no work done as well. Because for example, let's say we have a box and we're applying force here. And this is the distance that the displacement that we wanted to, um, this is how we want it to move. The object will not move in this direction because there's no force acting in this direction because our angle is 90 degrees and therefore cos theta is zero and therefore the product is zero. Or if we're pushing on something or we're applying a force and the displacement or the distance that it travels is zero, then our force, then our work is also zero. So for example, if you're pushing a tree, let's say you're like applying a lot of force and you're pushing a tree. If the tree doesn't move, then no work is done, right? So just to clarify, work is only the, in physics terms, work is done when you have force in the direction, uh, um, in force and distance in the same direction, or you have a component of the force acting in that direction that you want the object to move. I hope that's clear, okay. Just to clarify the whole thing, I want us to do an example. But before I solve this example, I'll give you a few minutes to work through it uh, based on what I've explained earlier. Okay, that should be enough time. I will go into the example now. So it says an emergency worker applies a force to push a patient horizontally for 2.44 meters. So we have the distance on a gurney with near frictionless wheels. If there's no friction based on knowledge of free body diagrams and we're pushing in this direction, let's say, and there's no friction, that means there's no force that's, um, the, the resultant force would simply be the force that you are applying. There's nothing acting in the opposite direction uh, to prevent that from, to prevent your, for, uh, to negate that force basically. Okay. It says determine the work done in pushing the gurney if the force is applied horizontal and of magnitude 15.5 newtons. So in part A, we have our force of 15.5 newtons. This is the gurney and you're pushing it horizontally. So the force of 15.5 newtons is applied horizontally. Our theta in this case is zero, right? Because you're pushing in the same direction that you, um, in the same direction that you want the force to go, the object to go. Now, if theta is zero, using our work formula, sorry, using our work formula is equal to F cos theta d, right? So we have our distance is 2.44 meters. What we have is 15.5 times cos of zero, which is one, times 2.44 meters. 
then that will give us 37.8 newton meters right and one newton meter is one joule so that's the same thing as 37.8 joules and don't forget your unit because your unit is very important 37.8 is very different from 37.8 joules so part B says, determine the work done if the force or magnitude 15.5 Newtons is applied at an angle of 25.3 degrees below the horizontal. So let's say this is our, this is the horizontal, the direction we want the, that we're measuring in. And this is the direction in which the force is applied. Our thing is 25.3 below the horizontal, so 25.3 degrees is an angle between the force and where we want it to go. So we need to find the component of this force in this direction. And from what we derived earlier, it's simply the cos of that angle. So our work is equal to F cos theta D which is equal to 15.5, because the force is still the same, plus 25.3 degrees times the distance, which is 2.44, right? And that gives us work is equal to 34.2 joules. Okay. Now, the third question says, Describe the difference in the observed motion between A and B. Now we see that the work done in A is greater than the work done in B, even though the force and the distance are exactly the same. And that is because the force acting in part B is at, a, is at an angle, meaning that the component of the force that's acting in the direction is smaller than the component of the force acting when our force is completely horizontal. I hope that clarifies work and um, in terms of direction and things like that. Okay, so now that we have done that, let's move on to the types of energy. Now, in physics, we discuss kinetic and potential energy a lot. And so I wanted to share um, what those are and derive formulas for them in order for you to be able to solve questions in that field. So kinetic energy is energy of motion, like I mentioned before. Kinetic energy deals with a moving object. So if an object is in motion, it possesses kinetic energy. So kinetic energy depends on the mass and the speed of the object. Okay, so now to derive a formula for kinetic energy. From Newton's second law, which holds for all um, objects, we know that the resultant force in an object is equal to its mass times acceleration, right? And from the above, what we've discussed, um, the work done, the total work is equal to the resultant force cos theta times change in distance or distance moved. And because we're dealing with an object in motion and we're trying to find the energy of an object in motion, we apply um, the uniformly accelerated motion equation, um, which should have been discussed in kinematics, in the kinematics section of um, your, uh, of physics of uh, your curriculum. We know that final velocity squared is equal to initial velocity squared plus two times acceleration times distance or displacement, change in distance or displacement. Now this can be rearranged by taking the initial velocity squared to the other side of the equation. You negate that. So we'd have V final squared minus V initial squared is equal to two A delta D. And if we're isolating for the acceleration, we can divide both sides by two delta D, two delta D. We can cross these out and that gives us this formula where acceleration is equal to V final squared 
minus V initial square divided by two times change in distance or displacement. Now, if we, we know that these three equations hold true for an, a moving object, right? We know that resultant force is equal to mass and acceleration, uh, work is equal to this, and acceleration is equal to this. Now we can solve for work, the total work done, because the total work done, again, is simply change in energy, right? And if we're only assuming, if we're assuming that all other energy stays constant, and the only thing that um, we were considering is that the a constant net force is applied to this object, causing its speed to increase from an initial velocity to a final velocity. And it moves at a constant acceleration because there's a constant net force. Therefore, these three formulas hold true. They make sense. Okay. Knowing that, that the acceleration is constant because the force is constant. And the only thing that's changing is the velocity, meaning that it's at the same, it's, at the, it's on the same level plane. It's not moving higher or lower. Um, and the only thing that's changing is the velocity. We know that these formulas hold true. Now, what we can do is substitute equation three, which I have labeled here, into equation one. So instead of having acceleration here, we have our resultant force is equal to mass times this, V final squared minus V initial squared over 2D. And we sub that in here. Make sense so far? Good. Now, we know that work total is equal to resultant force times cos theta times displacement. And we know that The resultant force is equal to mass times V final squared minus V initial squared over all over two times displacement. Therefore, we can sub in the resultant force delta F into this equation here, giving us this. Work total is equal to mass times VF squared minus VI squared all over 2D times delta D. Now we can cross out delta D because it appears in the numerator and the denominator. And we're left with one over two M V final squared minus one over two M V initial squared. Now, the only thing I said was that we're changing kinetic energy, meaning that we're moving from one speed to another speed. If work is only the change in energy or difference, in energy, then we know that this is the final kinetic energy and this is the initial kinetic energy because the work is only the change in kinetic energy in this case. And so our kinetic energy is half mv squared, which is one over two times the mass times the velocity squared of that object. Right? So again, this is in line with what we our previous assumption, which states that the kinetic energy is based on the mass and the velocity of an object. And we say it's proportional to the mass and it's proportional to the square of the velocity. Okay, again, if there's no change in other forms of energy, our total work, which is change in energy through a force, is our, initial, our final kinetic energy subtracted from, um, minus our initial kinetic energy, right? Which is our change in energy. So work total is delta K. Now we will do one uh, sample question to, um, sorry, I add a page here. Okay. Now it says, what is the total work in megajoules is required to cause a cargo plane of mass 4.55 times 10 to the five kilograms to increase its speed in level flight. Level flight means that it's not going to higher altitudes. Let's say this is the plane. Uh, not really good with drawing, but this is a plane. It stays on that level flight. It doesn't go higher, it doesn't go lower, which is important because we're going to go to another form of energy, which is potential energy, which deals with um, elevation and distance from the Earth's surface. So it's at constant level plane, meaning that no 
other, it's assuming that no other forms of energy change. And the speed increases from an initial velocity of 0 0.105 meters per second to a final velocity of 185 meters per second. Okay, so it's, I always find it easier to write down all of our um, given um, parameters. So our mass M, which is 4.55 times 10 to the five kilograms. Our fin initial velocity VI is 105 meters per second. And our final velocity is 185 meters per second. Before I solve this question, I'll give you uh, a few minutes to work through based on what we know about what our total work is and knowing that no other forms of energy change. Okay, now let's go into the solution. So the work total is equal to our kinetic initial, our final kinetic energy minus our initial kinetic energy, which is one over two times the mass of the object times V final squared minus one over two times the mass of the object times V initial squared. Now the mass of the object doesn't change. It doesn't drop any cargo on its way. Nothing happens to the object. So we're assuming that the mass is the same, right? So we can, um, factor this equation to look something like this. One over two times the mass, V final squared minus V initial squared. Okay, now we have our mass, we have our V final and we have our V initial. All of our um, parameters have been given. So we can just simply plug in our calculator, our um, adding machines and we can find what our work total is, which is one over two times 4.55 times 10 to the power of five kilograms times our V final is 185 squared minus our V initial 105 squared. These as in uh, meters per second, this is in meters per second. Okay, now we have that our um, we have that our, uh, when we plug this into a calculator, we get 5.28 times 10 to the nine joules. Remember that the question asked us to convert this to megajoules. So one megajoule is equal to uh, one times 10 to the six joules, right? And so 5.28 times 10 to the nine joules is equal to how many megajoules? We can do this by simple cross um, uh, multiplication. Uh, so let's say this is X and then X is equal to one megajoule times 5.28 times 10 to the nine joules divided by 10 to the six joules, right? Uh, or one times 10 to the six joules. Okay. And then we can cross out units and that leaves us with and 10 to the six and this becomes 10 to the three because we subtract when we um, cross our powers. And that gives us 5.28 times 10 to the three megajoules as our final answer. Now, before uh, we finish up, we have one for final form of energy, which is gravitational potential energy. And this depends on mass and elevation above the Earth's surface. So gravitational potential energy is basically energy stored in distance above the Earth's surface. So the higher you are above the Earth's surface, the higher gravitational potential energy the object possesses or you possess if you are the object. Um, similar to how we derive the formula for kinetic energy, 
we can do the same thing for gravitational potential energy, where we have that work is equal to force plus theta times change in displacement or distance above the Earth's surface. So now, one thing to note is that every falling object has constant acceleration. So it's called acceleration due to free fall sometimes, because if you, for example, throw something off a cliff and it starts to free fall, it falls at a constant acceleration at 9.8 meters per second. So every, um, nine, so 9.8 meters per second squared, my bad, sorry, it's an acceleration. So for, So for every second, as the object falls, it accelerates or it increases its speed. So for every second, its speed increases by approximately 9.8 meters per second. Make sense? Okay, great. Now, because it's an object that's falling, assuming that air resistance is negligible, the force acting on it is what? That's right, it's weight. And weight of an object is dependent on, because we're on Earth, it's 9.8 meters per second, which is the acceleration due to free fall. So weight is our mass times gravitational constant, which is G, right? And assuming that our weight is acting in the direction or it's not acting in a direction, then we can find the component of the force in the direction that we're looking for. In this case, it's also cos theta times the change in distance. Now we're assuming that as we increase our distance from the Earth's surface, our gravitational potential energy increases as well. So the higher you are, the greater your gravitational potential energy, right? So knowing that, we can solve this simple question. A diver of mass about 57.8 kilograms climbs up a diving board ladder and then walks to the edge of the board. He then steps off the board and falls vertically from the rest, from rest, to the water three meters below. The situation is shown in figure three, which is this. Determine the diver's gravitational potential energy at the edge of the diving board relative to the water. Okay, so relative to the water, which is, we're assuming that the water is our Earth's surface in this case. And we mentioned that the higher you are from, the, the further you are from the Earth's surface, the higher gravitational potential energy. Now, in this case, he, we're assuming he's directly above. So the theta, our angle theta is zero degrees, right? So using that analogy, we know that um, our distance y, so our force, so our potential energy, because this is delta y, this is y final minus y initial. So our potential energy is equal to mg times y, or some textbooks use h as a matter of terminology for mg h, right? So I'm going to give you a few minutes to work through that question before I, um, you can pause the video and work through the question before I give you the solution. Okay, great. So we've been given that the, Diver's mass is 57.8 kilograms. We know that our gravitational constant, because we are on Earth, is 9.8 meters per second. And our height or distance above the Earth's surface, which um, or above the water, which is our relative point, is 3 meters. So our potential energy is equal to 
sorry, kilograms. 57.8 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times three meters. And that, sorry, that is our potential energy is 1.7 times 10 to the three joules. Okay, and that concludes our lesson on um, work and energy. I hope it's been clear. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you.